Yeah, this is the historicity of artifacts using counter use by Simon J. Evnine in Metaphysics Journal. So, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's not that bad because uh, the first page is just a you know a cover page, and then you know we've got down to you know yeah, eleven pages. It's a little bit long. The words are a little small, but what are you gonna do? So best I can get for right now. Okay, so here we go. We'll find out. And as always, please comment along the way. We'll find out. If anything good. Oh, you, you've met the cruise. That's cool. I've, uh, <laughs> I've had actually weird... I've not actually personally met Helen DeCruz. I've had some... I don't know. My interactions have not been like... They've just been a little odd, so... Yeah, but as far as I can tell, as in philosophy, she's very good. So, but yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, don't want to say anything else. It's because it's just it'd be unfair to read too much into my unusual interactions with philosophers. <coughs> okay, so it is not enough to affirm the queerness of use. To bring out the queerness of use requires more than an act of affirmation. It requires a world requires a world dismantling effort. Oh, several Zoom conversations. That's interesting. Okay, cool. Yeah, what the... F yeah, what is a world dismantling... Why can't I write? What's going on here? I want to write. Oh, did this crash on me? It crashed. Well, that was interesting. All right, let's try, try again. Okay, try it again. Let's see. Can we highlight? Let's see. What is a world dismantling effort? Okay, that's all I want to do. In previous work, I have developed and deployed a neo-Aristotelian account of the metaphysics of artifacts. Okay, Excuse, sorry. Here I am to extend my account in two significant directions in order to address a, phenomena, a phenomenon called by the critical theorist Sar Ahmed queer use. It will be my contention that my account of artifacts extended in the ways I suggest can show that something like Ahmed's queer use, a notion developed in a socio-political context, has ontological underpinnings. Alright, so we have some socio-political socio context going into ontology. Let's find out. 1. Queer use and counter-use. Sarah Ahmed describes her herself as a work herself as working at the intersection of feminist queer and race theory. All of these fields inform her book What's the Use on the use of the uses of use where predominantly in its final chapter she characterizes what she calls queer use. Let's see if we can make this better. Here we go. That's better. Here are some of the things she says about it. Queer use. Ahmed tells us is to make to make audible, to listen to use, to bring to the front what ordinarily recedes into the background. It is how things can be used in ways other than for which they were intended or by those other than for whom they were intended. It involves a commitment to a principle that not all uses could or even should be foreseen and can therefore lead to a releasing, therefore can lead to a releasing a potentiality that already resides in things given how they have taken shape. It is not being willing to receive the will of the colonizer and hence living in proximity to violence. To queer use can to queer use can be to linger on the material qualities of that which you are supposed to pass over. Queer use can be offered as a offered as an ethics of finitude and appreciation of the wrinkle or the scratch, expressions of time on the surfaces of bodies and things, loving what does not and will not last. Okay, I have no idea what the hell that is, but we can find out. Author says, It is clear that Ahmed is not attempting to define queer use, and the characterizations just quoted are not intended as individually necessary and jointly sufficient conditions for its application, but some themes emerge particularly strongly in Ahmed's work. The norms of the straight use of artifacts are determined by those with power. They are the ones who get to say who can do what with what. This is one way in which their power manifests and maintains itself. Queer use is made by marginalized and oppressed groups, women in patriarchy, p people of color under white supremacy, LGBTQ people under heteronormativity, and others, as a way of loosening the grip of their oppression and reclaiming some of their material environment. As such, it is fraught with, with risk. 
Because I am not a queer theorist, and so I am not entitled to the, to the term, and because queer use is not precisely defined by Ahmed, I will introduce my own counterpart of the expression, counter use, which is intended to overlap with a lot of what Ahmed is interested in, but is not coextensive with her concept. Here is my definition of counter use. I think of counter use as something that is done collectively by a number of agents or by a community rather than by a single individual. <laughs> yeah, Maddie, oof, I got you. A single agent might accomplish it if she is sufficiently important or prominent. It is undertaken deliberately and thus requires a collective and at least somewhat explicit intention to change the norms governing the ongoing use of a type of object or an individual object in virtue of its belonging to a kind under which it is subject to the governing norms of being challenged. Yeah, this whole thing is, uh, this is not what I would call an easy read. Um, this is one of the problems with metaphysicians is that they go on and on and on and it's not the best. But basically, there's only two things that have happened here. Yeah, yeah, Frank, there you go. Well, some people enjoy this. There's only like two things that happen. There's the queer use, which is basically how you use things as an oppressed minority under the scope of some, you know, hegemony. And then the thing, what they're calling counter use, is the metaphysical counterpart of the sociopolitical uh, heg like, use of objects under the hegemony in terms of the ontology. So it's like... So, so it's the ongoing use of a type of object in a different way. Okay. It is thus, yeah, so but like it's not terrible what they're saying. They, they haven't like completely gone off the deep end here. Just uh, it's metaphysical writing can be a little much. All right. It is thus performative. Its status as counter use is intended to be recognized as such as it, and its success depends at least in part on this recognition. The norms that are challenged by it principally are the norms governing the intended use of the artifacts. Frank says, when the pandemic closed the lo local golf course, all the dog walkers took it over for months. Yeah, this is the sort of thing. Like, you're using it in the r ways that it was not intended, and basically it ceases to become a golf course at that point and becomes a do dog park. All right, so we'll talk about more of this in section four. If intended use is understood broadly, this may include restrictions on who is entitled to use an object. So counter use will typically involve multiple agents using artifacts in ways that lie outside their intended uses, which may on occasion consist simply in their use by un unintended users, or perhaps better, by intended non-users. Yeah, see, this is the thing. In your golf course example, people with dog walkers, they may have been the same group of people. If all of a sudden it was taken over by like punk kids and they got away with it, then that would be different because golf courses tend to not like punk kids because they're afraid they're going to mess it up. But uh, if it's like, you know, the rich locals who live around the golf course, then it may just be the same crowd, but just maybe not the golfing crowd, but like the same sort of socioeconomic crowd. Okay. So the intended non-users, that's what they want to focus on here, the marginalized. This use will be performative and aimed at a significant change regarding the object or type of object in question. Uh, Maddie Holmes says, golfers versus punk kids. I swear that was a mid-1990s kids movie. Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't know. I, I think I used the term punk kids because I didn't want to go straight up uh, for like some like oppressed minority. It was just who do golfers not like? But yeah, it might have been just kids back in the 90s <sighs> author's contention in this paper will be that counter use is not o only a politically significant kind of action as Am ahmed takes queer use to be but that is ontologically transformative counter use if successful quite literally changes the world yeah, golfers or skaters yeah and there was yachters versus punk kids movie for sure yeah so what was i watching i was watching i was thinking about hackers uh, earlier today and that was like punk kids um, versus uh, what was that corporate people uh, evil corporate uh, peoples and the uh, FBI so yeah punk kids yeah uh, cause uh, I had a what's her name Lana Lux is a streamer and uh, she's good to have on in the background like, like she's a programmer and so she's making a video game but she looks just like Angelina Jolie so you're basically sitting around with Angelina Jolie streaming. It's ridiculous. Um, but like, yeah, that's why I was thinking about it earlier. Hack the world, yeah. 
damn the man, hack the world. All right, two, a neo-Aristotelian theory of artifacts. In order to make my case for this contention, I begin by outlining my own neo-Aristotelian account of the nature of artifacts. My account is inspired by Aristotle's claim that for substances, the formal, efficient, and final causes often coincide. What a thing is, the formal cause, and what it is for the final cause are one and the same and that from which the change originates the efficient cause is the same in form as these this is an aspect of aristotle's view that has not been taken up in much of the recent resurgence of neo-aristotelian metaphysics uh no i mean i'd i'd say well what's fine put two okay yeah these are okay these people um are not this the group of the metaph analytic metaphysicians have not taken this up if you go to heidegger you get an exact uh you get a straight up discussion of this in like uh the question concerning technology this is like his exact problem like talking about this stuff but in analytic philosophy you do not get this uh discussion that's fair okay what I take Aristotle to be getting at, to put it in non-technical terms, is that for objects that fall within the scope of a theory governed by this principle, one cannot separate an account of what such objects are, the formal causes, from accounts of the how they come to be efficient causes and what their functions or characteristic activities final causes are. Certain kinds of objects essentially have certain kinds of origins and certain kinds of uses and functions. Consequently, one cannot deal with any one of the one essence, function, and origin without, at the same time, uh without talking about something about saying something about the other two. All right, let me explain this because I know I went through that very fast. This is a pencil, all right? Uh, pencil, pencil, multi-pass, um, pencil. So what? Do you, how do you describe what this is? Well, you've got an efficient cause is how was it made? And so you've got like this shape that it was made into this, that it could be easily held in the hand. The use of it is so it can be easily held in the hand and it's got the graphite in it so that you can write. What's the final cause so you can write? So all these things are tied together. What, how was it made? Like by people to make a pencil. What was the use is to be a pencil to be used by people. And what is it made of graphite and like this wood so that it can be used easily to make, to make lines. But like this is the three ways of talking about um, stuff. You'll find that as equipment for the pencil fighting game. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Well, this pencil was not. This is my pencil, not your pencil. <coughs> but uh, okay, Frank. <laughs> but yeah. So the formal cause is like, what's the form of it? Is the form of a pencil. The final cause is like writing, and the efficient cause was how was it made. Um, the last one of course is the material causes what is it made out of and so you have you these are all like tied together um and like i said the fact that this hasn't been discussed in analytic philosophy is a little bit annoying but it's been around since this discussion has been around at least since the 50s with the question concerning technology from heidegger okay how this looks for artifacts is this. An artifact of kind K is essentially the product of human activity. Specifically, it comes to exist when a maker works on some matter M with the intention of making a K out of it. So, okay, you're making something with some idea in mind out of some stuff. Eh. K, the artifact kind, is essentially tied to certain uses and functions. You, chairs are for sitting on, beds for sleeping in. So what the maker produces, if her work is successful, is essentially an artifact of kind K. That is, K is a substantial kind made out of it, but distinct from M, that has the function of use, uh, function and uses of you, essentially. Yeah, so you make the pencil to be a pencil and to be used as a pencil, essentially. So, if she makes a chair, the object that she makes is essentially a chair. It could not have been a table, though, of course, the matter the chair is made out of might have been used to make a table instead. So, like, yeah, this is the intention. Who, what was the maker up to? You can't say they were making a table when they're making a chair. Okay. Furthermore, the object that the maker makes, the chair, is not a chair just in virtue of it being sitable on, or more broadly, in virtue of having the distinct shape and heft of chairs. A swamp chair, the random product of lightning striding a bog, may be indistinguishable from a real chair taking into account only its current intrinsic properties, but it is not a chair, though it easily that could easily be used as one. Chairs are essentially a type of artifact. The swamp chair is not an artifact at all, the product of intentional making, and hence cannot be in a chair. Yeah, so I was just saying, if you're going to make an artifact, and that's the whole point, then even if you found a naturally occurring one, it wouldn't have been intentionally made. And so if you think there's an intentionality that goes into the objects, then they just can't show up uh, randomly. They have to be part of uh, like being made by someone with that intent. 
Frank Big Time says, what happens when someone finds a swamp chair and decides that it is now a chair? Um, it becomes an artifact, but it's not the same kind of artifact. Like if they move it onto their patio, it will, you can use something as a chair, but it becomes, it's a chair, but it's like a different kind of object. It only becomes an artifact, uh, accidentally and not, uh, like because it was made to be one. So it's an accident. It's an accidental artifact, not, uh. I guess a necessary artifact, which would be something that was made for that specific purpose. So, like, you can make a, it's a fine distinction, but, like, that's what they're trying to do here. Yeah, see, next sentence. What features in the maker's intention is not the function itself, but the artifact kind that is associated with a function. So this is basically, they're just claiming, um, like, this is what chairs are for. And even if in a particular case, the maker did not intend the result for it to be sat on. But what they're saying is important is the intention. If the maker made the chair with the intention that it could be used only as a display model, then the object still has the kind relative function of being sat on, but also has an idiosyncratic function of being used only for display. I say artifact is distinct from its matter. This is required if we are to allow, as we should, that a given artifact can change its matter over time while maintaining its identity. In virtue of what, then, is the artifact distinct from its matter, despite apparently sharing so many properties with it? Or, to frame the same question in different terms, what kind of thing precisely is an artifact? I mean, this is a classic um, philosophy thing. It's called the ship of Theseus. You can repair a ship over time, and eventually, the ship no longer is, has any of the same wood that it was made out of. Is it the same ship if all of the wood has been replaced over time? The standard approach to this among contemporary Neo-Aristotelians is to bring into the picture a third entity in addition to the object itself and its matter that plays the role of form. This may be a property of relation, from fine, a mathematical function, a structure, or a principle. My reasons for being wary of these attempts are two. One global and one local. First, globally, there is... A danger, one actually faced in some cases, but looming in others, of building into an object's identity all its features and possible embodiments. This will be true if the form is something like a function, excuse me, and the function must specify for all times and all possible worlds which quantity of matter is the matter that the object at that time in that world. Yeah, so if you said this pencil has to be made of wood, this wood, that's stupid because pencils can be made of, you know, other pieces of wood. Yeah. So this builds far too much into the object itself, which in some sense ought to be independent of its vicissitudes. It could have been made of different wood. It would still be basically the same pencil. Okay, a second reason is local to the case of artifacts in particular. None of the approaches just canvas treats artifacts as ontologically distinctive, but artifacts I think are ontologically distinctive, and this distinctiveness has something to do with the relations between origin and essence and function I outlined above. A theory that has nothing special to say about that seems to me to miss the most important feature of artifacts. In the face of these problems besetting an analysis of artifacts in terms of other ontological concepts, I prefer to treat them as sweet and generous objects. Okay, whatever. I mean, sweet and generous just means, like, completely unique. But, like, eh, come on. All right, nevertheless, we can still say some ontologically helpful things about them. Their ont ontological nature is not the same as that of non-artifacts. It is distinctive. It is made internally to the object created by the very act of creation. I offer the following four postulates as holding for artifacts. All right, first bullet point. They have matter, but they are not identical to matter. Second, they are essentially made by intentional making. Third, that intentional making takes the form of a maker working on the matter with the intention to make an artifact of a given kind. And lastly, they have their functions essentially in virtue of the kinds to which they belong. I mean, yeah, this is just reiterating some of the Aristotle, but like this functions essentially, okay? And then like the intentional making. I mean, this is um the... Heidegger goes into destiny saying, look, why are we making any of these things? We have like some sort of organization to our uh, human culture. And like that is what is giving us reason to make something. His example was a chalice. Why are we making a religious chalice? Well, you have a religious uh, custom and then like this whole sort of like uh, society does this and says, well, you need a chalice to have this religious ceremony. And so you make 
the chalice intentionally for that thing and it has that function essentially which is what to which they belong that you can drink out of a chalice and that's the sort of thing that's an artifact has these intentional sort of destiny of the community what is the community actually doing with itself okay author says i describe artifacts as ideal objects not because they are real but because they essentially depend on facts about their makers intentions these intentions are not components of the object but the work on the matter that they guide through throws a shadow forward and this shadow that as it were hovers over the artifact making of it an ideal object S using a different metaphor the novelist St neil stevenson describes beautifully what i'm trying to say quote how can he walk across a field salted by the retreat of the last glacier with countless stones and pick out of and pick out the arrowheads why can the human eye detect a tiny artificial form lost in nature's torn and turbulent cosmos a needle of data in a haystack of noise it is a sudden sparkling connection between minds he supposes the arrowheads are human things broke loose from humanity their organic parts perished their mineral forms enduring crystals of intention intention it is not the form but the lethal intent that demands the attention of a selfish mind. Uh, Maddie says that's 100% practice. Practice? Oh, sorry. Practice? Yeah. I mean, like, how do we know what this is? It, it is like human practice. Yeah. So I was trying to think if you were making like a neologism there, like making something up. But yeah, it's 100% practice to like make stuff. Um. Like, this is the thing, but there is an intentionality. Like, if you see, like, arrows, like, not just, like, like little arrowheads, but, like, if the full arrows were there, it'd be harder to miss. But the point is that, like, humans can sometimes recognize other human work. Um, like, if you were to see, like, bowls, not just arrowheads, but, like, you know, clay bowls, they it, it would be harder to mistake those because, in some sense, those are very, you're under as archaeology, so you're coming from that. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Now, I have... All right, let me finish up this little paragraph, then we can compl let me complain about it a second. So much for a summary of my account of artifacts, I want now to think about extending it into two complementary ways in order to develop an account of counter use that will be fairly faithful to the Ahmed's conception of queer use. The first extension concerns creative power of users, the second introduces the notion of historicity. <coughs> Alright, so what was I saying? My complaint, like I and I, and I think as you point out. You have to have experience. You have to have like experience with these things. Like you were saying, not everyone can uh, differentiate between artifacts and rocks. But the thing is, if you find something that looks like a cup, like this, that does not look like um, like natural material, you're going to be able to pick it out before because it's going to, in some sense, be something that people can use. And you can, like a chalice is something that you're going to recognize that fits a human hand. The idea that you can recognize something that's made for humans because it kind of works with general human bodies is a thing that like we can do and we can't always no of course we can't always uh determine a creator's intentions and reasons for making them but like you can sort of recognize like a human activity at work frank says in a world with substantial manufacturing what is the intermediate state of a, a screw for example to be part of any number of potential artifacts so we'll get to that in a sec um yeah, so, and Maddie says, it's literally one of the biggest issues in a field, a religious object or a salt cellar. Yeah, but see, that's the thing. We can't find intention all the time, but you can see that is, like, the act of a human intention. You don't know what the intention is, but you kind of know that it is someone had to do this. Otherwise, it wouldn't look like that the way it is. Um, the in intermediate stage, the screw, um, that would fall under, like, the general makings of uh, tool work, of tool use. Uh, Frank, like screws are tools in themselves. They're not the end product. That is part of the uh, pro uh, process of tool works, tool use. And so making tools is part of that. And then the tools themselves have their own artifact uh, style. Now, once you have like what is like a hammer in that case, what is a hammer, what's a nail, what's a screwdriver, then you can talk about those as the tools of the making that the people use to create like their lives. No, no, you're, this is a good point, Maddie, and this is one of the problems. That, the fact that you have an archaeology hat on, and I bet this philosopher does not have the, uh, an arch, uh, like an archaeology background, and they're already annoying me because, like I said, this is ground covered by Heidegger very well, and it's not, you know, 
analytic philosophers do not discuss Heidegger for many good reasons. First off, because he's very hard to talk about. Second, because he was a Nazi and people just want to avoid Nazi philosopher um, philosophy. Um, but like legit, like he was supported the Nazi party and all back in the day. But uh, it's like this is the thing. Like, so there's two things here. Like they're skimming over what you said and from like the philosophical things is getting skimmed. Maddie says, right, they went to some metaphor from fictional writer, which is fine, but it tracks from the scientific metaphor. Yeah, exactly. And so the ph the philosophy here is getting, they were not able to, they did a science fiction writer. It's a very nice uh, paragraph, but like they were unable to like articulate it themselves. And that's okay. They use someone else's words. That's a fine way to do it. But again, like uh, it seems like they're not 100% on the uh, fundamentals here as far as I'm concerned either. So like you have your your stuff from your side and then I have mine from my like history of metaphysics side. <coughs> That's okay. It's like, it's not like terrible. It's just like, it seems like you're, they're missing some of the history. That's all. Okay. But it doesn't matter. That's not going to matter for their point, I think actually. So we'll, we'll see where we're going. Manny says they could have used Margaret Mead or similar people using similar concepts. Yeah, like it seems like they could have done a lot of different stuff. Um, what's interesting is I know I doubt you can see all the little words here. I'm seeing who they're referencing. They're referencing um, uh, contemporary metaphysicians. So this is like people, just other philosophers. They're not talking about um, like these other sorts of ideas from other areas. They're only talking about uh, philosophers and all the, the notes and all the little stuff that's on the sides. It's so, like if you're talking about Kit Fine, Kit Fine is a philosopher at NYU. He's this British dude, and he ta he has published in this journal on metaphysics. He's very famous for his metaphysics. But it's like he is, I don't think he writes on our, uh, Heidegger. He's an analytic philosopher. So you think he's coming in via metaphysics and aesthetics? Yeah, that's Valpo. Exactly. I think this is coming from analytic metaphysics. Like this is just all I think that this is this is and I don't even have a problem with that it's just I like it would be nice if you were going to talk about artifacts archaeologically speaking you could talk also from the archaeology side where as far as I'm concerned from the history of metaphysics side if you can do metaphysics about uh, philosophy of technology yeah well this was the same as the previous uh, paper for Shane they were talking about history and sociology, even though they made a nice philosoph philosophical point in the end. It's a little light on the other uh, topics, but that's okay in some sense. It's philosophy. You're not going to be able to go into a ton of detail with, um, like, for what a historian would want or a sociology would, a sociologist would want or an archaeologist would want if you're talking archaeology. Okay. The creative power of users. Counter use, I have suggested, has an ontological and not just a political aspect to it. It can actually change into other things. It can bring new things into existence. To reconcile this with something like the approach to artifacts I have just outlined, we need to show how that account can accommodate creation by a disparate group of users. This, in turn, requires dealing with creation by users and creation by disparate groups. I take these up in turn. The so called the so-called intention-based account of artifacts and their functions of the kind I have just given dominate the current field. Such accounts are ad advocated by R Risto Hilpinen, 1992-93. See, this is what I mean. Th the person here is just starting from, like, analytic stuff from, like, the 90s. Okay. Risto Hilpinen, Randall Dilpert, Lynn Baker, and Amy Thomason, to name only some of the most the most prominent defenders. Different as these views are, they all share a commitment to the idea that artifacts depend for their existence and their functions on the intentions of the people who make them. Who make them. The users of artifacts have no official ontological role. How then can my intention-based account be re reconciled with, by use? Maddie says, if I can throw a point out, I think it undermines the point that there's an automatic recognition of human-made that the author assumes a lot of artifacts can't won't be recognized for a lot of reasons no absolutely and this is part of the difficulty here here they're really really leaning on the intentions like this is really um so on this is on the intentions of the people who make them that's really they're leaning super hard on this and as you're pointing out this is not so it's kind of vague it, it's really vague actually Frank says, if an artifact cannot be recognized, it no longer exists. Um, or it only exists for the people who can recognize it. Just because you can't doesn't mean it may not exist for you, but maybe it can exist for other people. Yeah. 
uh, yeah, I think this is the thing. It can be recognized by different people at different times. And so, like, you just can't make a blanket statement like that, that it is no longer recognized for everybody. You can say you don't recognize it, and as such, it is just a rock for some people or you or whatever. But, um, yeah, that's the thing. It's, uh, I don't think it's universal. So... So it's of the people who make them. So it's relative. The intentions or the object is the object in question relative to the people who made it. Uh, Maddie says technological changes or access to areas or even just changes in understanding. Yeah, that seems like where they're actually going uh, with this is that there's going to be ways of modifying the intentions. So objects when like they modified like uh, right here. I have um, my pencil and I have a US quarter because I'm in, I'm in New York and this is a US quarter. I do not use these things to write usually. I have another pencil over there I write with and I have a quarter right here. These are my demonstration objects for philosophy roulette actually. I don't use this quarter as a quarter. I use it as an object that is easily recognizable and I can use it to make philosophy demonstrations actually here. So, like, these things are actually not a pencil and not a quarter. These are philosophy demonstration objects for me. Frank says, if two people recognize two different intentions for an artifact, is the object simultaneously two artifacts? Um, it looks like the author might um, agree to that, although they were saying the object is in the intention of who made it. Um, it look it's looking like though their queer use is going to shift that so then you're going to have the people who originally made it and were in power and then secondly the queer use of it which is going to be different so yeah you, the interpretation can be no Maddie I think you're right the interpretation is different but I think the author is actually going to go take the further step and say there is now a shift in the object itself <coughs> so let's see Consider this example discussed by Catherine Kozlicki as a potential objection to intention-based theories of artifacts. <coughs> Sorry. Suppose that Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, initially intended his new device to be used as an, an, as an aid for the hearing impaired, while later users came to think of the telephone as a certain kind of long-distance communication device, which allowed two or more users, whether they are hearing impaired or not, to carry on a conversation even when they are far apart. Uh, this is like borrowed from some other people who suggest that the above description is historically accurate. Interesting. So Alexander Graham Bell was initially thinking of hearing aids. They remain neutral on the question of historical accuracy and wish to use this scenario only as a further illustration of the possibility and imagined by Cornblith that user intention can override the author intention in determining what features are relevant in an artifact's membership of a certain kind. Yeah, so user intention can override in author intent. And this happens all the time. Um, if you guys saw the movie, I saw, I was watching it the other day, Arrival. Um, what's her name? The protagonist gives a like tells a story to like back up her stuff and it she lies it, 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 the what the author was saying was wrong but like it didn't matter yeah death of the author viewpoint yeah that's from rhetoric and that's cr this is part of um yeah this is a similar point okay given author intention based account of artifact essences assuming that alexander graham bell in fact intended the device he intended to have a certain function specifically to aid the hearing impaired and assuming that there is no obvious reason to think that Bell's original author intentions misfired during the production of the first prototype then the device Bell invented is in fact a hearing aid and essentially so and the same applies to every subsequent device which is successfully produced with the intention of being the same type as the device Bell invented uh, yeah the producers yeah that's exactly springtime for Hitler in Germany and yes too many assumptions Okay, and Frank says, I do not even slightly buy that the intention to make a device like Bell's overrides the intent to make a telephone in a way that makes the artifact essentially a hearing aid instead of a telephone. No, I think that's kind of the point here, Frank, is that um, they're setting it up to sound ridiculous because they want to make it sound ridiculous that it, the author intention is what you should be looking at. And so you've got the point, but like they're setting you up for that. 
Proponents of this view are committed to holding that the intentions of the late, latter users cannot override Bell's original author intentions, according to which the device he invented is a kind of hearing aid and lead to a reclassification of the telephone as a certain kind of long-distance communication device. But the scenario under consideration suggests that, that, that it is in fact possible, under certain circumstances, for the intentions of later users to override the intentions of the original author as to how the device he or she has invented, designed, or produced is used. And yet, this is exactly the point right there, Frank. Of course, we can re we can change what the uh, telephone is doing. Like, of course, clearly. And again, I know this may start a flame war. The graphics interchange format of the type with moving images on the screen is GIF with the hard G, not GIF. I don't give a rat's ass that the author said GIF. You can, he can, he named it graphics interchange format, GIF. That doesn't mean the author is right. The way normal English speaking is used is to do GIF with a hard G like the word gift. All right. Just because the author said that, I you can respect the author and say, well, I'm respecting it, but you are going against normal English practice. The author does not get to change normal English practice for acronyms. Just because they said that, it's moronic. I've had my say. Okay. Okay. Goes Licky. Kosalicki writes here of users overriding the essential function of the telephone by using it in other ways, co coming to associate with it a new essential function. What is going on? On the one hand, we want to say that there is a kind of object, the telephone, that initially has a function determined by the inventor's intention, but subsequently comes to have a function determined by the use made of it. This is not merely a case of a hearing aid being used as a communication device, something that is certainly possible. It is supposed to be a case where the collective and persistent use of a telephone as a communication device means that it comes to be the function of a telephone to be used, to be so used. In other words, the power of the right kind of use is to alter the function of a given kind of thing. At the same time, it is acknowledged that the intended function of artifacts is essential to them. On the view I developed above, this essentially, this essentiality is given de re, not de dicto. That means of the object, not of how we're talking about it. Frank, you, Frank, uh, excuse me, Frank big time says, but it's not the same artifact. It was a very similar physical object, uh, but it was created with a different intent. Um, they're assuming that like you could be making like basically the same object like you like everyone it's an off-label use for telephones like say you have like uh pills for like say heart medication but it turns out it cures like you know the common cold and so everyone's using the same thing it's not it is a it's basically the same artifact or it's as close as possible but now it has a different intent like so you're using pills for like instead of like being heart medication now you're using it for weight loss but it's basically the same thing um, they're trying to say as close as possible there, Frank. Um, yeah, yes, they agreed earlier that the molecules of a thing isn't essentially the thing. They were saying more along the lines of form, though. And uh, so they were including form in that, uh, Frank. And so that was part of uh, the formal causes, the form of the thing. So you can use something of the similar form for different uh, purposes. Yeah, Maddie was also assuming, well, that was the problem that everything is single use. That's the intention use. Um, and so when things have multi-use, they're going to say basically, fine, you can have as many uses as you want that are intended, but we're still using it for off-label things for different uses that were never intended. So just because it can do more than one thing, we're specifically breaking the mold here for the uses or breaking the intentions for the uses. Yeah. So, thus, if the intended function of the objects manufactured under the name telephone changes, then one kind of object is replaced by another kind called by the same name. Although Kozlicki acknowledges the essentiality of the function to, to the kind, and I think she considers it to be de re, that means of the object, not the name, the corollary about the change of kind is obscured by her interpretation interposition of a further fanciful intention which is allegedly involved in the production of these things called telephones namely the intention to produce something of the same type as the device bell invented yeah this is sort of like are you really doing what uh bell said um of the same type at that point if you're making a long distance thing or are we ignoring his intention so yeah so this seems to insulate the unity of the kind 
across changes in essential function. I think this is what you were saying, Frank, that you, are you really doing the same thing anymore once you stop having the, uh, once you stop trying to do what Bell did? Okay. So why is the change in kind not announced head on for advocates of user intent intentions to embrace? I think what may be happening is this. Bringing an object into existence seems to require physical labor with respect to the object's matter. If mere use were able to bring into existence a new kind of object, we would have a case where creation did not involve any work on anything. And cases of creation without work are, in the eyes of many, disreputable. Zimmerman, for example, argues against Baker's author intention author intention oriented account by reductio on her account one would have to say that simply by that simply by dragging a piece of driftwood inside and intending that it be or used as a coffee table one would thereby bring a coffee table into existence elsewhere i have defended baker by arguing that creation in this way is perfectly legitimate hence i am quite willing to say that users can create new objects and new kinds of objects merely through use yeah i i bet that's Frank, I, I bet like that it seemed like too easy of a uh, thing. Like, yeah, I completely agree that easy way out there. Hence, I'm quite willing to say that users can create new objects and new kinds of objects merely through use. But the crucial thing to be clear about is that creative use is use of an object, which is not a, which is not the kind of object being created. If it were, there would be a paradox since one cannot use something until it exists. Okay. Yeah, if you create something by using it, you, it needs to exist before you can actually do anything with it. But you're using the already created object in a new way. It is the non-standard use of one kind of object that brings into existence another. It is by using a piece of driftwood as a coffee table that the user brings into existence a coffee table. The coffee table is distinct from the driftwood, its matter, because its function is essential to the kind to which it belongs, but is not essentially essential to the driftwood. Yeah, you can narrow down the uses. The wood can be done used a lot of ways, but then you are narrowing it down by using it as a coffee table. So it's not essential to the driftwood, but you can narrow the uh, use down of the driftwood. The non-standard use of a kind of hearing aid brings into existence a new kind of communication device, the standard use of which is as a communication device. Use of one thing just is, in the right circumstances, a way of creating another. Maddie says, religious artifacts is a classic example of something that can be multi-use, can be both utilitarian and ritualistic, and religious imbued with belief constructs in it. And be with belief construct constructs in it. Exactly. Exactly, exactly, exactly. That's why Heidegger used the religious chalice as his example. I think it's a much uh, better example, or it's a much more sophisticated example. Maybe they're just using simple examples in this paper, but like the religious chalice brings in a whole, like all that stuff, and that really matters for, uh, like if you're really thinking about what is the technology for, if it's religious and like has religious and belief uh, imbued in it, then it's a much more so sophisticated than just like my cup, which has water so I don't dry out. But yeah, but I mean, that's the thing. That's a better, that's a more sophisticated example than the driftwood. Okay, hence users can be makers. On the distinction, once the distinction is made between the object, the object creative use of which is made by users engaged in non-standard use and the object created by such use, creation by use is simply a rather special case of ordinary creation on, creation on my account. Yeah, so... Yeah, that's the example. This is still a pencil, even though it's more display pencil at the moment. So that's basically what's going on. But you can restrict uses down on stuff. But of course, I can still write with it. Um, it's like it's not like a broken pencil or anything. Like it could be a broken pencil, and you wouldn't know. Like this pen, this is a pen. I could also use this pen for stuff. I don't know if this pen writes anymore. I think it does. But like this could just be a display pen at the moment. But like I don't know if that one actually writes, so it, can't, it may not actually function as a pen anymore. But yeah, <sighs> that's right. Okay. Yeah, so they're basically saying by using something in a new way, you are changing the intent. You are giving a new intention, making a new object, even though you have not uh, brought the object into creation in the same way someone who constructed the object has. But you are like repurposing their construction. Okay. 
The second aspect of creation by disparate users that requires consideration is the disparateness of the multiple creators. On my view, it will be recalled, creation of an artifact is a sui generous process of, impo of imposition of mind onto matter that happens in virtue of the intentional work involved in the making. In the cases we are interested in here, in, interested in here the creative counter use of use made of some kind of object. Yeah, so basically, you have to impose a form for some reason that is intentionally needed for you. This can easily accommodate, accommodate multiple creators if we think of those creators as forming a joint intention in the work. And this is what uh, Maddie like. If you are all in some sort of religious. Uh, organization and you need a chalice for a ceremony this is your joint intention that we all have to participate in the cer ceremony and that's why we are creating chalices of this kind and everyone has to put input into it that's why this is a the religious sort of joint intention thing is much is very important okay we might say that the several makers here are of one mind and it is this mind that is imposed on the matter yeah the religious mind uh like a thought that has to be imposed on the uh chalice to make it of the appropriate kind to function in a religious ceremony okay the problem arises when we have as we often will in cases of counter use a number of disparate users who do not obviously form a joint intention with each other okay to see how creation by multiple disparate users might happen, let us consider an example which does not involve counter use. Frank is going to be a complete bastard here, really, that's kind of hard, and wonder if intending to use an object is sufficient work to make that object an artifact. Um, it would make it an artifact to you. Um, so, like, if you break down the world in a way that would be inten intended for you to do something with it, then that would turn that into an artifact for you, although it wouldn't really do anything for anybody else, I think. So it's not, like, it, that crazy of a thought, but, like, you know, when I decided that this quarter would no longer really be used as a quarter, it'd just be a uh, display quarter, then it's like, that really did all the work I needed. I just, like, left it here in th this room that, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna leave that there. So it's not really, like, that hard to do. But, like, that's all it took was, as a display object, that's all the work that took. It's like, leave it here. <coughs> okay. So we're talking about one that does not involve count views. It's just standard creation here. The case the author has in mind here is one way in which a language can come to exist. See, this is annoying. What the fuck does this person know about how language has come to exist? Like, this is not a philosophy of language paper. This is not a history of language paper. This is metaphysics. And I mean, it just is going to be hand-waving here. This is a little annoying. Okay, imagine people at the boundary between two cultures communicating as best they can without a common language. Each starts out by using their native language, slowly and loudly, supplementing with bits of the other's language as they become familiar, gestures pointing, and a heavy reliance on context. Like, this is just nonsense. Like, they're making stuff up here. This, this sort of thing annoys me. It's like, yeah, people figure out other people's language, but, like, who knows what this story is here? I don't understand this. Okay, as the communities interpenetrate their... <laughs> As the communities interpenetrate, they're gradually stabilized conventions governing words and uh, syntax. Uh, in terms of archaeology, I don't know what this is. Like, maybe this is how it happens. I, I don't understand. But, like, what does this, like, as the communities interpenetrate, they, they're gradually stabilized conventions over governing words and sy syntax. Yeah, I, I don't know. The need for gestures for slow and loud speech and for heavy reliance on context subsides. Simultaneously and increasingly, the speakers using these new conventions come to conceive of themselves as having a common language. Okay, so people eventually figure out how to talk together. That's all that matters here, I think. The languages matter. The materials out of which it is made is something like the linguistic conventions governing syntax and semantics. It is distinct from those conventions since they may change over time when, while the language retains its identity. Eventually, speakers of the language produce dictionaries and grammars for it, teach their children... <coughs> excuse me. Teach their children its history, and ha including how its syntactic and, syntactic and semantic conventions have changed over time, and establish authoritative language academies designed to stifle the very fluidity and flexibility that led to the creation of a language in the first place. This story, in fact, gives a rough and ready account of how of the development of Creole languages. I mean, okay, something. Uh, Maddie says, those kinds of cultural neighbors can go so many ways. Sometimes they create communication, sometimes they don't and ignore other groups. Sometimes they attack them, sometimes they move away. Yeah, so basically they're giving just some sort of, they have some example here of language birth they're referencing. Um, 
I, I just, I don't like this at all, but like, whatever, it's fine. They could have used any other example. Um, yeah, and sometimes, as you say, they can intermix and still create dis distinct groups. Like, it doesn't, they're just saying this is how it happened once. I mean, maybe this is how it will happen once. It's fine. Like, they just needed an example of uh, creating a new artifact out of two groups that's okay you know it's like if i give like uh the trojan horse you know so like they created a new art piece to like give like the their enemy which turned out to be the trojan horse and like sneak people into the thing it's like you could have just talked about so any new like piece of like military tech like that probably would have worked here and without the this whole sort of like weird story about language creoles are uh, maddie said creoles are created all over the world but that's one example of that happening others can have different reactions yeah this is what i mean this is kind of a i don't love this example it may work for them though all right in this example the work by which the language is made is the uncoordinated labor of many people over time how can this uncoordinated labor be seen as the imposition of mind onto matter okay so they wanted something that was uh all they had to do was like uh what's it called the you know like uh paths that have been like made by people like cutting across lawns that's all you needed to do here did the path form the path formed by many people taking the same shortcut that's the old that that's the example they needed here you didn't need to do this crazy thing with languages yes they could have said one possible example yeah but like this is like a massively weird like a, like a, a lot of baggage in this example all you need is like people cutting across lawn yeah and like make a path and all these people are uncoordinated it's uncoordinated labor of many people how could like a, a uncoordinated labor be seen as the imposition of mind onto the matter like when people make a path and they're cutting across grass to put it crudely whose mind how do these multiple and disparate users spread out in space and time manage to be of one mind? There are a number of philosophical approaches to collective action and joint intention that might be appealed to here. Margaret Gilbert, one of the chief theorists in Sayre, recognizes the need for an account of groups like the one in the language example. Yeah, I agree. Like, I hate this. Like, I dislike this uh, little section. I bet there's other ways to argue this. And like this of one mind is very strange. All right. Quote. In many populations, particularly large ones, members do not know all, do not know one of the, another as individuals. Let's call such populations distant, <coughs> distance populations for the sake of a label. The question arises whether the members of distance populations can participate in a joint committed commitment together, and if so, how such a commitment can be formed. End quote. I don't think joint commitment is the right tool exactly to describe what happens in the case of, I am interested in, but I cannot undertake the development of a better one here. Yeah, this author needs to read a few anthro textbooks. Yeah, this is, uh, I think this is weak, unfortunately, here. In fact, the language I favor, though it is not accompanied by anything like a theory, is that of Benedict Anderson's imagined communities. Gilbert considers and rejects this expression on the grounds that imagined incorrectly suggests imaginary, and of course she is right. I don't think there is any thing at all imaginary about groups of people involved in creative counter use but the allusion to imagination does get at something important something to do perhaps with a utopian feeling of the kinds of projects these groups may engage in how is creation of a creole in any way utopian the fact that people have to find language is not a utopian thing it's out of necessity if you use my example of people cutting across the lawn in the same way eventually making a path through like the grass so it's like packed dirt that is not utopian at all that's just like you know again pragmatic sort of thing and you could and you could have used that sort of example because it would show all the people they're not of some sort of imaginary community they're all of the same sort of let's cut the corner here community like that's not imagine that's like you know you can see how people all do the same thing for the same reasons okay before going on to the second extension of my initial theory i will mention an example that illustrates the phenomenon i just described <clears throat> yeah so and maddie says so many um creoles are built from colonialism slavery hardcore dystopias yeah like this is not the example they should have used all right the function of a slur is to derogate the group to which it is applied Suppose that this function is an essential feature of such terms. Members of the derogated group may, in response, in the acknowledge in the knowledge that the indefinite others use that indefinite others of them, an imagined community, are doing so acting 
to counter use the slur. They counter use it by using it in a non derogatory way to apply to each other. Yeah, so people can uh, take on slurs and call like other and use it in a non harm uh, harmful way. In that case, is to you know counter the use of it. By using one thing, the derogatory term, in a way at odds with its essential function, they bring into existence a new term, a word phono phonologically similar to the original slur, but having a quite different function. Once the new term exists, using it in a non-derogatory way will no longer be a case of counter-use, but of ordinary use. The semantic change in this case is different from regular semantic change in that the latter generally happens without counter-use. There is no new imposition of mind onto matter as there is with the appropriation of slurs. Hence. With regular semantic change, we are not required to conclude, though we may on other grounds, that a new word comes into existence. <coughs> you don't like that this was uh, connected to the previous part of the paragraph? Yeah, well, their examples here are just not good. Um, it's like they just want, they, they know, here's the problem. They know this is weak, and so they had to add another example to try to make it to bolster their ca case here. And, uh, I mean, I don't know how much it's helping. Um, but yeah, they're, they're trying hard to get some philosophy of language in here. Cause basically I'm betting like, this is the sort of area that these philosophers are coming out of. Um, no, no, it's not bad luck that you're here. This is fine. Like this person needs to be, this is not like in this area of philosophy, these sorts of examples get thrown around. And so that's the thing here. They're throwing around examples in this area. Oh no, for the author, no, it's good that you're here. They should be called out. Um, they should be called out for like kind of having this sort of wishy-washy examples. It's not good. It's just not good. I mean, you're using the slur in one way, then it gets appropriated by the group so it doesn't have the same power it used to have. But like, okay, the counter use here is non-derogatory way to apply to each other. And then it's, uh, it's shifting what the words were doing. <clears throat> yeah, and it can be both, yes. So is there anything new say, is anything, uh, let's see, is it different from regular semantic change? Let's see, I'm just trying to see if they said anything interesting. Okay, it, they're saying it may not be counter use. It could just be a new uh, appropriation of the word too. It could be a regular semantic change. It's not that there's a new word. <coughs> All right, historicity. Let us return to think about the second extension of the theory presented in section two, to the ca core case of a singular maker working with some matter with the intention of making an artifact of a certain kind out of it. How many more pages we got? We're in seven. We got to get to. 11 basically 12 all right a bit more we'll see okay let's return to think about the second extension of the theory presented in section two to the core case of a single maker working on some matter with the intention of making an artifact of a certain kind out of it yeah but we can go fast it won't be so bad this they're gonna they're gonna have to actually say something now we're getting to the second half of the paper they have to say something so let, we're gonna find out Take, for example, an art, art, artisanal Swiss watchmaker making beautiful and original one-off watches on commission. This is the sort of case the core account is developed to capture. There on her workbench are the materials out of which the watch is to be made, springs, cogs, diamonds, etc. The watchmaker sets to work on these materials with the goal of making an artifact of a certain kind, a watch. It is by working on the materials with that intention, that mind, the concept watch that features in the artisan's creative intentions gets imposed on the matter for the result of being a unified single object, the watch that has those materials as its matter, but is distinct from them. So it will persist even if springs are replaced over time. The entire description of the situation is confined to the artisan and the materials on her workbench. <clears throat> but of course, this is not actually the entire situation. There are many further factors at work in the background. The watchmaker comes to her trade through family inheritance, and the family has operated as part of a long tradition of Swiss watchmaking that holds itself, formally or informally, to certain very high standards. There are the sources of the materials needed. The diamonds are blood diamonds. The cogs are made of a small woman-owned collaborative uh, in Mumbai, financed by microloans, and the springs are mass-produced by a sweatshop in Vietnam. There are the conditions of capitalism that allow some to pay a huge amount for a custom-made luxury, 
and allows the artisan to make a living selling custom-made watches. And clearly one could go on indefinitely like this. When the artisan makes this particular watch at this particular time, it is like a nexus for all these forces, conditions, and histories. But, but do any of these factors have an ontological implications in the way the intention of the maker does? Does the fact that an artifact is generally produced as a nexus of a variety of historical and social forces mean that the artifact in itself is freighted with all of that? Or is it all just part of a history of the artifact which may have causally contributed to the existence and character of the watch, but on which the watch does not essentially depend? When introducing the idea of imposition of mind onto the matter above, I use the metaphor of the maker's intention casting a shadow forward over the resulting object. The same metaphor can be used here. Hand waving. What is this hand waving? Casting shadows forward? Come on. All sorts of circumstances, in addition to the maker's intention, cast a shadow over the object. Having resorted to fiction once already to help my to express my view, let me do so again. Here my inspiration comes Philip K. Dix, the man in the high castle. The character who is speaking here, a wealthy collector, is ridiculing the idea I want, but in doing so, gives a good impression of that idea. Quote, Getting up, he hurried... He hurried into his study, returned at once with two cigarette lighters, which he set down on the coffee table. Look at these. Look at the, look the same, don't they? Well, listen, one has historicity in it. He grinned at her. Pick them up. Go ahead. One's worth, oh, maybe forty or fifty thousand dollars on the collector's market. The girl gingerly picked up the two lighters and examined them. Don't you feel it? He kidded her. The historicity? She said, what is historicity? When a thing has history in it, Listen, one of those two Zippo lighters was in Franklin D. Roosevelt's pocket when he was assassinated, and one wasn't. One has historicity, a hell of a lot of it, as much as any object ever had, and one has nothing. Can you feel it? He nudged her. You can't. You can't tell which is which. There is no mystical plasmic presence, no aura around it. End quote. Historicity, a thing's having history in it, is what I am after. According to me, however, all artifacts have historicity, not just ones involved in historic events. And by history, I don't just mean things in the past. Contemporary social conditions also count. All right, so this is, um, it's just saying things have, you know, place a context, a history, a context. Like, there is no need for this, like, historicity, um, overbearing philosophy stuff. Like, come on. It, things have their context, what they're made out of, where they're made, all this stuff. Like, this, this is just uh, making up words. But that's alright. I mean, you can do that in philosophy, but I don't see what the real point is yet. Let's find out. Can we make sense? Oh, Maddie says, they're claiming that artifacts don't require historical weight to be to still be an artifact. Well, they're claiming that all of them have uh, historical weight. Um, that's what they're saying. And so, like, all of them, none of them. The historicity, I guess, is um. Some will have more, but all have some. Okay, can we make any sense of this idea? Here is at, an at least part, at least partially successful attempt. Okay, we're coming from the opposite sides. Yeah, sure, fine, fine. Associated with any artifact is an indefinite set of all of its properties. Some of the objects will have in virtue of its kind. Others will reflect contingencies of its history. Not all of these properties will be known by anyone who makes or uses the artifact, but at least for artifacts, or artifact kinds that are still current, we may expect most makers and users to be aware of some subset of these properties. And for some of them, of those known, some number will be deemed salient by that person. It will not be the same known and salient properties for everyone. Maddie says it's like when people think treasure when it comes to artifacts, but archaeology is more into artifacts, context, and context regardless of material. Yeah, exactly. This is what they're saying by salient right here. It's like this is like what's important. Yeah, that looked terrible. Like what's important to like a particular person is salient. But consider some subset of the indefinite set of all an artifact's properties that are such that one would reasonably expect them to be widely known and considered salient. Can call this set and artifacts common salient properties CSP. Suppose, for the sake of argument, that there can be at least widespread cons consensus on at least core members of a CSP. So the generally thought salient properties. Frank was saying, I was really interested in this first, but over time it feels like nothing interested in being claimed or predicted. And this is why I was warning y'all about the metaphysics. This is what happens a lot in metaphysics. They start off sounding great and it goes downhill. Um, 
I like metaphysics, but it's just very rare you find anything that is uh, really good. And I apologize. <laughs> um, yeah, really keen? Okay. And so, yeah, this is one of the problems with metaphysics. This is a very difficult subject. Very, very difficult subject to get anything very interesting in. And basically, a lot of this stuff, it peters out, is what happens. Um, it's just what it is. It just is what it is. It peters out. So, I don't have a whole lot more to say about that. It's like, you see where this is going. You were told there'd be Sarah Ahmed. I, I know, that's what was, uh, this is the point. I, this is what I was saying. We have to get to the end. We're almost there. And they should be making a claim about the queer objects soon. They need to be doing this. And they haven't gotten there yet. And I'm afraid it's just going to be hand-waving at the end. Um, so, that's where we're, what we're getting to. So, we'll see. Okay, in the example from Philip K. Dick above, for example, the, there is likely to be a widespread agreement that being in Roosevelt's pocket when he was assassinated in a possible world in which he was assassinated is a salient property. For an ordinary mass-produced widget, the property of having been made on a Tuesday will almost certainly be non-salient for most people, even if they happen to know it. Now, my claim might initially be put as follows. For any particular object, A is, a is essentially dependent on its having the properties in its CSP. By itself, this will yield counterintuitive results. We will probably not want to say that Roosevelt's lighter bec becomes a numerically distinct object when it acquires the new salient property of being in his pocket when he was assassinated. So some story must be told about the kinds of changes an artifact CSP can undergo to account for ordinary change over time. Maddie Holmes says there should be they should have focused more on artifacts being potentially being imbued with the importance and ritualistic for a repressed group that might not be recognized as such to the privileged group. Yeah, well, there's a few different ways they could have gone. We are still waiting to see which way they go. They really only have two more pages to say anything, and uh, that would have been more interesting. They may if they say that that would be more interesting than what they've said yet so far, Maddie. Okay. Finally, we can say that an artifact CSP is, is its historicity and changes to it, its historicity beyond those permitted by ordinary change over time will result in the creation of a new object. So something that is unusual about the historicity can make it a new object. All right. What happens to the original object will depend on the particular circumstances, as I shall illustrate below. We cannot, of course, change which properties an object has had and which have been salient, but we can bestow new properties that go beyond those permitted by ordinary change over time, and most important, we can change which of its properties are salient. These are the ways in which counter use is capable of creation. All right, finally, we're getting somewhere. We can change the salient properties of an object. We haven't really talked about this, but here's what we're going to do. Take the author's example of slurs from the previous section. Suppose one were to object to my treatment on the grounds that the derogatory force of slurs is a pragmatic rather than semantic feature. Hence, when a slur is appropriated, its semantics remain the same, so there are no good semantic grounds for saying we have a different word. Let it be so. If derogation is not a semantic feature of slurs, it is most certainly a salient fact about them that they are used to derogate. Counter use in the form of appropriation changes that by ostentatiously using such words to create solidarity rather than division. Hence, it brings about the creation of a new word since the appropriated word has a different uh, salient properties, core salient properties from the old one. What happens to the old word? In this case, the old word homophonous. Homophonous? I haven't said that. Homophonous with the new, though perhaps not quite, and distinguished by small differences in smell spelling, continues to exist. Which word one uses will depend on the circumstances, and it may often be opaque to the user which one is uttering. The phenomenon of someone's wanting to use the new one, but actually, but actually because of circumstances, offensively using the old one is well attested. Okay, so basically they're saying they're changing the context of how you're using stuff, and that's changing the object. Okay. <sighs> Can the identity of artifacts really be opaque to competent users? The wealthy collector in the quotation from Dick is making an argument that historicity in his narrow sense, but how much more so in the author's sense, is bunk. The argument turns on the assumption that relevant properties of an object should be detectable directly by some kind of perceptual faculty. 
The fact that one cannot tell which of the lighters has historicity is evidence that no direct perception like knowledge is available to us. But the idea is that the essential features of an artifact must be detectable without knowledge of its history should always should already be rejected even before one gets to historicity. Above, I asserted that a swamp chair, something that appears to be a chair, created randomly when lightning strikes a fallen tree in a swamp, is not a chair. Given how it looks like a chair and can be used as a chair, one could not tell it was not a chair without knowing that it did not come into existence through the intentional action of suction of an artisan. Oh no. <laughs> We're getting an oh no, okay. One might think that the implausibility of there being any swamp chairs undermines the efficacy of the example. In actual fact, nothing looks nothing looks like a chair just by accident. And that why yeah, but nothing yeah, but many things look like uh, artifacts by accident. So like as Maddie was saying earlier, people can't tell. So think about the flint arrowheads in Stevenson's example. Yes, this is what, this is what Maddie was saying. Take two shards of a flint to all intents and purposes indistinguishable. If one of the shards came to have its shape as a result of an agent's intentionally working on it to make an arrowhead while the other just got chipped off a larger block by chance, then the first is the matter of an arrowhead and the second is not. It just isn't though it could conveniently be used as an arrowhead and might even become it, the matter of one if so used in the right circumstances. Yeah, so basically here we're going. This is the this person's an idealist is what it is. They're thinking that we can actually understand um, human intentions more generally than I think we really can. And Maddie says this person clearly doesn't realize that shards are very much reconstructed. Yeah, and recognized with different type of styles. I, I think this uh, author is being uh, idealistic and thinking that they can we can just spot these sorts of things and it's not very complicated. And they have not... Uh, understood the sophistication uh, that is going into this and you can see that by their examples they're using philosophy of language examples which are neither here nor there they're not using actual examples at work because um, the actual examples are much more difficult as Maddie and others have pointed out okay <sighs> Okay, obviously the main debt incurred by this approach will be to say how the members of an artifact's uh, core salient properties are to be determined. The answer, as indicated, involves reference to what can be reasonably expected to be known. When I described my basic account of artifacts in section 2, I called artifacts ideal objects. Yeah, they're, I, no, the author is ideal, not the objects. This is an idealistic theory. Because of the way in which the intentional act of their being is made essential to them. Yeah, see, this is the thing. This is a very strange idealism. Like, the idea that you can just do that, like, that this is going to be intentionally, like, essentially to them. It's very odd. The idea of historicity understood in the manner suggested here is an extension of the ideality of the artifacts. So that, like, that we can actually read into them, this sort of thing. <sighs> yeah, that's exactly the thing. This person thinks that, like, it, you can do it with the caveats they're saying, Maddie. In the case of making, the ideality arises from the nature of the relevant properties having been made into a, with a certain intention. In the case of historicity, ideality enters the picture not through the properties in the core salient uh, property, properties in a core salient uh, properties, though many of the properties will have to do with the mental states of people, but through the requirement that they can reasonably expect to be known. So, like the if the history is known, that that adds into the ideality of the object. The properties are there as potential objects of knowledge. Yeah, so objects, they're saying basically objects can carry thoughts with them. I mean, the, some do in terms of having the history with them. So, like, if there's an object that has a particular history, like it has a certificate, this was in uh, someone's pocket at a certain time, and that's like, well, that object doesn't actually have that in it, but, like, there's a certificate there, and you can kind of say it is a property of that object. Maybe that holds up. Maybe not. But, like, here, this is what I'm saying. We're just uh, basically... Two more sections, and we'll go through this kind of quick. Let me recap recapitulate and synthesize my suggestion so far. Historicity makes artifacts prime sites of e ideological struggle. This insight lies behind Ahmed's characterization of queer use. Okay, finally we're getting to what we were interested in. Many artifacts have, as part of their historicities, oppressive social relations and other things that make the objects themselves offensive to many. This point, without the ontological underpinnings I give it here, is well brought out by in Liao and Hubner. Counter-use can 
attempt to change the very objects themselves into less offensive ones. This can happen when users are related in the right way, as in Imagine Community, they can, through their disparate and uncoordinated actions, make changes in which properties of an object are salient. Let me now try and make this less schematic by considering a couple of examples to complement the example of slurs that I discussed in the previous two sections. Think of an anti-slavery museum that is housed in a slave plantation. The plantation has intended uses and intended users. After the end of slavery, it, it is no longer used by those, for, those users for those uses. Someone comes along, purchases the place, and begins to display artifacts that convey how monstrous slavery is and how and people come to view the things displayed. At this point, the users are counter-using a slave plantation as a museum. But as a result of this counter-use, a new object, a museum, comes into existence. When this object is used as a muse museum, it is not counter-use, but ordinary use. When people mount slavery-related displays and others come to view them, they are intended users who are using the museum in accord with its intended use. What happens to the original object, the slave plantation? In this case, the original object, which was subject to counter-use, does not exactly disappear. It becomes the matter for a new object that it is made out of. Question, question, question. All right, let's keep going. Let's see. The intended uses and users of the plantation are on display themselves. The plantation itself is an ex exhibit in the new museum. This is quite different from a situation in which a slave plantation becomes, say, a modern art museum. You mean, what if someone uses it as a wedding location? Well, yeah. You, then they're using it not as a slave planta plantation anymore. They're using it as a pretty setting. Um, so not so. This is what more. This is what they're actually getting to right here when they say modern art museum, something different, not a slave museum. Uh, you could say or as a wedding venue. In this case, the museum, the wedding venue, is made directly from the matter of which the plantation was made, the buildings, etc. But the plantation itself no longer exists at all. Wow, you're deleting it. Yeah, you're trying to ignore it basically at that point. Nor would we have in the modern art museum or wedding venue any counter use at all. At no point was there a performative rearrangement by an imagined community of the saliences of the former slave plantation. The creation of the art museum is not, or wedding venue, is not accomplished through counter use, but by quite distinct mechanisms. See, I think that's crap. If you don't, if you're using a, sla a former slave plantation as a wedding venue, and you don't know that, then either you're racist, <laughs> or you're doing it because you want to, you know, make use of the slave plantation and be like, we are now reappropriating it for a good purpose. So, like, this seems terrible. Frank Big Time, as soon. Frank Big Time says, as soon as no conscious being thinks of it as being intended plantation, there are no more plantation. Yeah, that's problem. That's the problem here that I was just saying. Like, I completely agree. Like, oh, all of a sudden now it's just gone. Poof, what happened to it? Yeah, so you wonder what pushed this example? Yeah, I wonder what this author is thinking a lot of the time. So, um, yes, or it's so systematically imbued as such by the community that people don't recognize it as such. Yeah, you could change it up and be like, where did we get this amazing wedding venue? Who, like, where did this come from? Why is this still here? And you could just be oblivious. Um, like, like that's being oblivious. That's not getting rid of the plantation. That's being oblivious to history. That's a very different thing. It's like, there was a Reddit a guy on Reddit um, recently that uh, his uh, company rented out like a, pla a plantation house. And they said we're going to have like a theme of like, you know, slavery or whatever, like the old style, you know, plantation. And the, the whole point of the, the post was he was the only black dude in the company. And apparently no one thought it might be offensive to have like a plantation style thing on a southern plantation and only one black dude. And you were supposed to dress up in like the old style thing. And so what he did with his uh, partner, he went as a slave like to the company thing. And like it horrified everyone. They all freaked out. And he made a ni very nice Reddit post. And apparently they uh, I don't know what happened, but like I think he like the company, you know, was at least some the lawyers were properly horrified and uh, tried to make it right. Frank Big Time says, "I feel like it conflicts with the overall idea because they assert that a person can have a person can happen along and recognize the arrowhead of stone. Someone else happened by and recognize the plant 
expectationness of the building. Yes, yeah, see, this is the thing. It's all this intention stuff. But of course, if it's all gone, then no one recognizes. It. They're all oblivious. It's um, then it's just gone. This is very idealistic because it all has to do with the ideas of the people. Maddie Holmes says, actually, there's a real uh, interesting 60 Minutes thing where this African-American family bought a really large house. I saw that. They bought a large house. Then they found it not only had been a plantation, but it had been where their ancestors had been. Yeah, they were finding, like, uh, gravestones of maybe where their, like, great-great-grandparents uh, lived and died and stuff. It was sort of fascinating. But, you know, what was interesting, they said that. Like, they had bought it to repurpose it. In some sense, they were like, yeah, like, we want to, you know, reclaim this. But, like, yeah, the idea that the plant, like, but the, did the history just no longer exist at all? I think that's a great point, Maddie, because, like, the, the people lived and died there. The land is the way it is because people changed it. And so you're saying the plantation no longer existed, exists? Well, it no longer exists in those people's heads, but not to the other people. And so it's like, which people are you talking about? It's very odd. It doesn't exist to the, the oblivious. That's true. But, like, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. <sighs> okay, within this context, we can actually accommodate several things that Ahmed says about queer use. Uh, Maddie says it did exist a little, but it was only in the original owner's family and later owner's families. Well, I mean, the gravestones were still there. Um, it's like, how do you, you, you're not getting rid of the bones in the ground, like not for a long time. So it's like something existed. It's like, yeah, it, it does exist in some way. I mean, it depends on what you mean by little there. It exists somehow, still. In the history of, like, why the land looks like those. Okay, the community history. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Yeah, because I remember that one of the guys said, um, like, one of the friends of uh, one of the guys that bought the house, this white guy who was, like, in one of the old families, he was, like, saying, like, at one point that, like, he knew some of the history just through the oral history of the family in the town. And, like, so his buddy, like, was asking about stuff, and he, like, he knew things. And, like, no one else had known because it was, like, passed down. And so, like, there was a little bit of community history still left uh, in the oral tradition of, like, the families that lived there. And so it mattered. Yeah, <laughs> Valpo's finally. We finally get to Amen. All right, so within this context, we can actually accommodate several things that Ahmed says about queer use. Not only do we have the salient contrast between the intended users, the white plantation owners and black slaves, and the counter users, people of all races intermingling in a common repudiation of slavery, and the contrast between the intended use, profitable production of some commodity, and use made by counter users, education and memorialization. The counter use also makes use audible it forces on us the recognition of the original intended use and the use currently be made out of it it lingers on the material qualities of that which you are supposed to pass over the new use displays the material qualities of the population we see how small and poorly insulated the slave quarters are and how sumptuous the main house uh, su sumptuous was the main house it offers us an appreciation of the wrinkle or the scratch we see as marks of resistance the scrawled initials on the walls or as evidence of oppression of the well-worn handle of a whip. Furthermore, since the counter use is of the plan, the plantation, you need a T right here, which is used as a museum and not the museum itself, which is the process of being made by this counter use, it is likely to be happening when there still exist people who value the original object highly. Hence, it could be described as not being willing to receive the will of the colonizer and would place the counter users in proximity to violence. Yeah, I mean, there's going to be people who don't really care that, like, there was slavery and they'd rather just have the land for themselves. Um, that's fine. So I guess really what the argument here is that in the process of continuing to use it in a counter way, then you are in that process making it the queer use because it uh, is as a museum doing its function pushing against the uh, colonizer use yeah this whole paper should be rewritten as a salience war between the users and the counter users yeah I mean they could have finished this whole paper in like two paragraphs at the beginning and said look the thing Ahmed said but just call it ontological and you're done it, nothing has happened in this paper they just are uh, recast everything ontologically and took a lot of words to say it uh, 
As another example, we can consider a case discussed by Ahmed, squatting. Suppose there is a house that was built as a single-family home in, suburbia, in a suburban area in the United States of America. We have some idea of its historicity, the erection of the suburbs, white flight, and the assumption of whiteness by previously non-white people such as Italians and Poles, redlining, and the attempt to share a nuclear family out of, by the standards of the powerful, the unruly family structures of recent immigrants, and so on. This house we are imagining has all that in its historicity, but it no longer has any people in it. Okay, so you've got like an abandoned house with all the shitty things that happen in America. Fine. The owners are very wealthy, live elsewhere, and keep the property empty as part of some tax write-off scheme. Now imagine that a loose-knit group of idealistic but down-on-their-luck young people, LGBTQ, LGBTQ kids who have been kicked out of their family homes by their parents see the empty house break in and start living there not as a nuclear family at all but as a commune of some sort truly an imagined community they continue to use the structure as a place to live but the differences between their community and the nuclear family structure adds new salient properties to the bill to the building and subtracts others Ahmed quotes Erica Doucette and Marty Huber, who write that the ranges of uses for squatted buildings is often much wider than simply providing a place to live. These projects link ideals with material realities and utopias. The kids in question make counter use of the building, thereby displacing one set of ideals, those of the nuclear white family with two children and a dog, with another set of ideals, those of oppressed people who dream of utopia that revolve around the tradition stretching back to antiquity of people forming intentional communities. There is the place of LGBTQ people in our society, especially of children who find themselves rejected by those who should be the most accepting, their families, anti-capitalist protests in the Occupy movement, and so on. Their case is quite different from a case in which another nuclear family simply moves into the empty home and makes unauthorized use of it. This would not constitute counter use and would not bring into existence any new thing. See, so yeah, like if they had just, the author had just stuck to this one example right here. And, uh, oops. Huh. This one example and just said, yeah, everything they just said, but this makes an ontological difference too. Not only do has the house stopped being what it used to be, but it's a new kind of house now as the center of this sort of like idealistic little uh, squatting enterprise. That's all that needed to be said in this entire paper. So, Maddie says nuclear families weren't the default in history. It's a relatively new concept. Yeah, like, sure. But the point is that even if it was new, it's getting reused right here. Um... Un, like it's getting undone right here so that's the whole thing and all, all they're saying is look it's a new object now too now is it really i don't know but that's all they're the claim is in this whole thing okay Unlike the slave plantation and the museum, squatting does not require that the earlier historicity remain in place the earlier historicity is not being made into an exhibit Valpo says, bro wrote tedious metaphysics after reading a cool paragraph from Ahmed. That's exactly what happened here, Valpo. That is 100% it. They're like, I can, like, you know, incorporate this into my work. <sighs> and they're very excited and they didn't do anything. What is important lies in the transformation, the takeover of one part of the artifact artifactual environment and is being put into the service of other ideals. The essential project of the intentional community as such does not require it to be created in the immediate space of a nuclear family, but it does require the loosening of the grip that the nuclear family holds and the squatting, one particular route to an intentional community, is one way in which the utopian actually gets to work at this loosening. The, I just call it idealistic, but they're calling it utopian. It's like some ideal that they have that is getting uh, pushed back by different ideas. The result is, on my account, a genuinely new object. The old object depended essentially on its historicity for existence. The loss of that historicity and the replacement of it by a new one means the destruction of the old object and the creation of the new. But it does not bring into existence an object of a new kind. It only affects the transformation of one house into another, numerically distinct one. <sighs> yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I know. There's a good reason to it because it takes you have to completely buy their thing that like the old object depended essentially on the historicity for its existence, and that's the problem. The idea like that everything the object has to deal with its like specific properties intentionally given seems way too idealistic. No. Th this person has to explain themselves. 
the author has to explain themselves, Maddie. And the idea that you're saying, no, it's not because you have a, an archaeological background is like, this is a good point. There are a lot of people that disagree with this. Now, you don't have to agree with them. This person could be like this person is allowed their opinion. They have not justified it, in my opinion, but they have said, OK, look, the history matters. And that's what they're saying. Um, they're saying it doesn't erase the previous uses. It erases the previous object as they define object. The object here has essential hist history built into it. As soon as you change the history to being a different history, then it is essentially a new object. Yeah. So the problem is, of course, if you say that just like I did, history is always uh, increasing and so it's like you're not actually always changing the history and so that's a problem because then it's always a new object as soon as hit, like another second ticks by because the historicity is different the, the author here would claim that like well I'm talking about the essential salient properties but then you get into ad hoc arguments well who cares what what do you think is salient versus me and then they're saying all right then you can go talk about the Ahmed stuff what actually is the revolutionary sociological and political differences but that is is not been added into this paper. They're just hand waving at that for their change in object. Yeah. So. Yeah. So well, the, the, they're claiming that the historical cultural construct, um, it's not getting erased. It's getting changed. That's the thing. And so it, it and since it depends essentially on it then as soon as it's changed it's no longer the same object because the essentials have changed which uh, are given by the salient properties as they want to define them well the part no they're saying no the parthenon is different now and it is kind of different now now what do you mean by object now you can argue that what you mean by object maddie is not the same as thing as what this author means by object but like they're saying it's not the same Parthenon that it was 2000 years ago. And it, it, in some sense, you can understand why the current Parthenon is not the Parthenon of 2000 years ago. It kind of does make sense. Now, are you going to say it's essentially the history, the history of the Parthenon that matters? Maybe, probably not. Yeah, that's the thing. You're looking at the material remains. They're looking at the historicity, which is all the historical properties of it, which does not uh, is not limited to the historical remains. So, but yeah, the problem is all the historicity that they're using goes all the way back to just um, Ahmed, whatever their uh, Ahmed said, and so nothing's been added about this. Um, yeah. Well, it doesn't strip out the historical properties. It changes them. They're saying is that the historical properties change over time because history changes stuff. That's fair. That's what history does. More stuff is added uh, and, or it's changed the way we think about it. And uh, of course, it doesn't strip out the historical properties. But how does it modify them over time? How we think about things? Um, again, all they're doing is relying on the Ahmed for that uh how that actually happens and they haven't added anything they're just calling it essential that's literally all they're doing is calling the Ahmed stuff essential so <coughs> okay comparison of counter use and queer use okay so this is now they're gonna try to dress up what they said as fancy here this is, and this is the conclusion probably yeah and that's it in this final section, I shall offer some remarks about the relation of the concept I have attempted to theorize here to its inspiration, Ahmed's notion of queer use. I have argued that counter use involves a certain kind of ontological transformation, but not all instances of this kind of ontological transformation will be cases of the kind Ahmed wishes to capture under the heading of queer use. I believe that for her, queer use is, all things considered, always something positive. But the same ontological process I describe here are also at work in bad cases of cultural appropriation. I completely doubt that Ahmed is that uh, simplistic to think that all queer use is a good thing. But okay. I mean, they probably only used good examples because that's what is most important. But yeah, cultural appropriation, I'm sure Ahmed understands what that is. There too, it can happen that a group of the right kind of the group of the right kind can performatively counter you something and thereby create something new in its place or of which it is the matter. Queer use then does not designate a distinctive type of ontological transformation, but would be one kind of counter use, a kind that is politically inflected in a certain way. And you can, of course, see this nowadays uh, when conservatives start to like reappropriate things from like uh, 
like the woke community and uh it's very cringe usually but okay but like this happens all the time like people try to reappropriate stuff it's bad but all right so not all instances of counter use are instances of queer use but what about the converse do all cases of queer use entail the kind of transformation in terms of which i have characterized counter use i think the answer must be no there are several reasons why for one, I have implied that counter-use requires an imagined community, but queer use, as Ahmed describes it, can be engaged in by a single individual whose efforts are not sufficient to affect an ontological transformation of the historicity of an ideal object. I don't see how they maintain that. I don't buy this, but okay. The tra Let's see why, they say. The transformation must rearrange the saliences surrounding an artifact, and since saliences are defined in terms of a conditions of a reasonable person could be expected to know, and that salient are salient to many people, a lot of force is needed. But why can't one person do this? One person can squat in a house. You don't need a group of people to squat in a house. Only in exceptional circumstances could a single person accomplish, accomplish this. A second reason why not all queer use comes with ontological transformation, even when it is undertaken by an American community, is that the use in question may be interrupted or the transformation fail for other reasons. Not all attempts are successful. But I mean, not all attempts are ever going to be successful, and not all attempts at queer use are going to be successful. Like, I find this very uh, arbitrary here. It's like you're saying, well, my stuff is more important because it takes a group. It takes, like, more effort. But, like, that's hand wavy to me. Like, really exactly why? Why does it take more people? That's all they're just claiming. They're not explaining this or justifying it. Okay, finally, not all queer use is use of objects, just as, in fact, not all cases of cultural appropriation are cases of appropriation of objects yeah take the hand wavy things that it's, it takes a village exactly maddie customs modes of behavior styles of speaking many other things of this sort can be put to queer use or appropriated but it is unclear without further consideration what the ontology of these things is and whether it follows the aristotelian model i advocated for artifactual objects yeah see this is the problem they don't even understand aristotle's ontology is meant to be universal like it has to follow the aristotelian model very few things escape it and uh if you're going to talk about technological objects like that's basically one of the like pain points for aristotle but they already said that those things qualify so this person like doesn't quite get the extent of the metaphysics okay to conclude, I've presented a neo-Aristotelian theory of artifacts on which they are ideal entities essentially tied to the way in which they come to be through the imposition of the concept of their substantial kind onto the matter by the work done by the maker. Yes, this is just straight up uh, Aristotelian stuff. Artifactual object almost sounds tautological. I don't think I've ever heard artifactual either. Um, yeah, artifactual happens in philosophy sometimes. Tautological, no, because you would compare artifactual objects as things that are human uh created versus natural objects like you know the moon or something the moon is not an artifactual object because like we had no uh nothing to do with the moon or like you know a deer or you know cockroaches those are not art those aren't considered artifactual because they have no um they're natural objects yeah so natural things are not artifactual it's just you know how it's defined in philosophy all right so yeah so because it has to be done like as the author says here work done by the maker the maker being human okay the author then described two extensions of the theory the first allows that things can be made by the use of something by an imagined community as in anderson's sense use of something that is not a k can impose the imagined community can impose the imagined community's mind on it making k a k out of it the second extension was to allow that more that more than a substantial kind can be essential to an artifact from the conditions that lead to its creation. Some are all of the historical conditions, and they include contemporary conditions under that rubric. Also, individuate an object, expanding its ideality and making it a likely site of ideological conflict. Inspired, well, K, K was just a random uh, kind. K is kind. Frank is so sad. The brief description of queer use at the start was so exciting, then the whole thing just didn't really go anywhere. Yeah, we have to read Sarah Ahmed, not uh, this person. Ahmed seems like the interesting thing, and they were very excited about Ahmed. And, uh, yeah. So, inspired by Sarah Ahmed's concept of queer use, 
The author deployed their expanded theory of artifacts to outline a phenomenon I call counter use and discuss several examples of this phenomenon. I've certainly issued several very important promissory notes chiefly around what an imagined community is. This is exactly the problem. They have no definition of like what actually a community is and how it acts to impose its mind and what historicity is. Uh, you can't impose your mind. We don't know what historicity is. It's just some random hand waving about like the properties things had and how it relates to artifacts. But my hope is that the paper may nonetheless be illuminating by bringing together ontological and sociopolitical conditions and processes. This seems a worthy task for social ontology. Um, you're wondering about artifacts is actually being used the same way. I would suggest ignoring everything this paper said. I mean, if you are interested in this, it's okay, but otherwise, just ignore this whole thing. This is, um, it was too messy. You can see all the things that they needed to have said down here they had to repudiate. They don't know what a community is. They don't know how mind is uh, imposed, the intention, uh, the intentions of mind is imposed, and they can't say what historicity is in terms of like the properties you're assigning to the object outside of it having salient things, which again is going to be hand waving for whatever community. They're going to say, well, what the important history is, and that's the historicity. If you have important history, well, what is that? And that's going to be of again up to the community, which they cannot define. Yeah. What's up, Karaga? How you doing? How's Minesweeper? I assume Minesweeper. What were you up to? What's going on, my man? Thank you for the follow, Team One. What's going on? What's going on? Yeah, Minesweeper, how's it going? I genuinely lurk your streams, but like, what's going on? Physics, bro. Thank you. Thank you for the files. Appreciate it. Yeah, we were arguing about this uh, paper here. This is like just how I've been spending my time lately. Um, welcome in. Uh, hi, I'm Nogre Zero or Nogre, whatever you want to call me. It's cool. Um, yeah, let me just a little uh, spiel for the folks come in. I used to stream Minesweeper a lot. I also helped make the uh, Minesweeper Pro, the competitive Minesweeper uh, site. Oh yeah, first time sweep streaming Minesweeper for the first time. Well, I want to get back to it. I do. I, I got to get back to it. I've just my brain is so fried at this point. I can't do anything. And so it's like, yeah, uh, tried to get Minesweeper like going on Twitch like during the uh, pandemic. And we did it. Me, Karaga, and some of the other people like we did a good job. Like more people play Minesweeper, I think, because of us. But yeah, so I haven't played Minesweeper in a bit. But uh, what I do normally on Twitch nowadays is I just read some philosophy and try to explain it, see if we have any good ideas about it. Sadly, this last paper had no good ideas in it, and it was kind of depressing. But like it was, you, we get to at least see why things were depressing here and why they what they wanted to do what they were excited about and why they failed they read an interesting paper they thought they were going to improve upon some of the ideas and it didn't work and we can talk about that frank was saying i wonder if they think salience is based on the total sum of all what all people would find salient or the sum of what people actually do find salient i don't think they have any idea they just want the idea that some people find it salient and they're not exactly sure what that uh that group of uh, people is so we were talking about what do uh, people find uh, important about like artifacts like you know like this is a quarter like and so this is a US quarter why is this sort of thing important and could it gain um, new properties that think someone thinks is important like you know if like this quarter happened to be special in some way how would that change the object as opposed to all other quarters um, and that's what this was about like what sort of things could we use to uh, change how the world is and so they were trying to take this queer theory about how um, people can resist you know whatever like the world is imposing on them and find new ways to use it problem is they didn't do a good job and so we were just finishing up I'm sorry we were just finishing up I'm losing my voice but if you have any questions about like you know talking about philosophy and stuff or Minesweeper for that matter let me know and uh, thanks again for the follows physics bra and team worm uh, yeah so cool uh, yeah so yeah the problem is, do you make an object by, like, just intentionally doing stuff? Oh. It seems v it's very difficult. 